So audio. If I double click the audio sound, it comes up in the source section here. And this is the entire clip, whether it's music or sound effects or whatever it is, it'll pop up up there. And that's where I can play around with, I can preview whatever I want. I can listen to certain parts and see what I want to put in. And I can set an in and an out point that in and out point will actually, it won't shorten the clip, but it'll actually take only that portion and put it into um, the timeline. What I wanted to do is I want it to sort of fade with the video. So just like audio, just like video effects, you can find audio effects here. And we're going to do audio transition and crossfade. Constant gain, constant power. I haven't noticed much of a difference with these. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take constant power and stick it over here. And I'm going to drag it a little bit longer. So it sort of matches the crossfade of the video. The other thing that I also want to add to this section is I want to add some camera motion sound as well. I don't just want the steaming because that still makes it sound a little bit flat. So I'm also going to take a look at this clip here. So I want to use that at around the portion that the camera speeds up. Now, if I took this audio, if I take the whoosh sound and put it on top of the steaming sound, the portion of the steam that's covered by the whoosh is now cut by layering them. You can have multiple sounds playing by using multiple audio tracks. There's a couple of things happening here that are a little bit weird. I want the steaming to be a little bit quieter. So I'm gonna go to audio track mixer and you see down here's audio one, audio two, audio three. If I play, I can see them playing here. I'm gonna drop this to minus 10 and I'm gonna drop this to minus five. Now, I don't have any rhyme or reason to doing this. These are just things that I've been playing around. I, you know, you try things going up and down. Um, but one of the things you can also do is as you're playing it, let's take a look at the numbers that we're seeing right over here. That gives you an idea of how high the decibels are actually going. So what you can do is you can just play around with it as you do that. Personally, I'm still at a point where as I add layers and layers, I have to listen to it back again and again. And as I add the music, I have to listen to it again and again to kind of fine tune it. But it's a starting point and you kind of figure things out. And that's the beauty of this whole thing is you kind of progress as you learn and things get fine tuned here and there. There's one more thing that I want to do here and forgive me if this is getting a little bit too in the weeds, but this is, I just learned this. So it's like, it's really interesting to me how you can play around with it. I don't want that whoosh sound to be so prominent. I want that the vision I have in my mind is, is I want a deep bass to it. I can actually add an effect called a low pass filter. What the low pass filter ends up doing is you can set a certain frequency. It only allows frequencies lower than the setting that you put to pass. Let's go to effects controls. I have this audio clip selected, so I'm seeing the effects that I put there. Let's drop this to 200. I set the low pass filter to 200. And what that does is any frequency above 200 is blocked. Only frequencies below 200 will pass. So by doing that, what I've done is I've altered the sound a little bit to make it more towards what I want to do. Now I could go and look for a sound effect that matches exactly what I was looking for, but it's a little bit more fun and a little bit more creative to be able to have that effect by changing little things here and there, adding effects to it. Now, something that I want to try, I'm not entirely sure. I still, I'm still kind of struggling with it. I don't know exactly what to do with it, but if I right click on the audio clip and I click audio gain, I notice here that it says the peak amplitude is minus 1.4 decibels. So if I normalize, hmm. Now, what if I set this to zero? It's a little bit louder. So when you look in the audio gain section, I guess it gives you a little indication of what the max amplitude of that clip you just selected is. And I guess as you become more and more familiar with audio, I guess what it does is it allows you to change the general volume of the clip. But so there's a perfect example of setting up the audio for one portion of the clip. Okay, so I've added all of the audio that I want. I've added the two layers of sound effects. I've adjusted the volume a little bit. So now we're going to add the music. I'm actually going to take the full music clip and put it into the timeline and then edit it there. So here is the part that I want to actually kick in at the end of that intro portion. So I'm gonna zoom in here, put my cut tool there. Cut, delete that, drag this over. Perfect. So I'm gonna go through it now and make sure that the audio is where I want it to and make sure that it transitions out at the end of the video where I'd like it to as well. So what I can do at this point, now that I've cut out certain portions and I'm working with a smaller space, by expanding the audio tracks, I can actually see where the waves actually match. 
like, this is all trial and error. What I'm actually hearing right now is that I'm hitting the, I'm hitting, I'm peaking. And on this side, you can actually see that it's actually peaking. So you notice that track three and track four are totally peaking because they're sitting too high. So if we drop them down, so another side point, and this is kind of what I've realized is the process of making it, right? Like when you're going trial and error, you start to notice things here and there, you start to tweak them. This is the really cool thing. This is why I'm sharing all this with you because in the beginning when you're not familiar, but you've learned enough to figure out, hey, this is wrong. How can I fix that? And you go and you fix it. This is by no means an efficient way of editing, but it's really cool to go to a point where like you're hearing things and you can tweak as you go along. Eventually you get to a point where you're so seasoned in it, you already, preemptively, you kind of know that certain things are gonna happen and you just set things in a certain way. And I'm gonna look right over here and take a look at what my peak decibels are. Way over. Okay, so I'm gonna drop it down to minus 10. I'm gonna drop this down to minus 10. Much better. For now, I can just leave it there. And then at the end, if I feel like music is too low and the sound effects are too high, I can always play with that. But the point is, I'm no longer clipping. So the next thing I wanna do is I want to actually add what's called an adjustment layer. Now, I know I wanna add an adjustment layer because I did this before, but what I actually want to do is I wanna adjust the color across the whole thing. But the other thing I also wanna do is I wanna add some cinema bars. And what I've found is you can actually do both with one adjustment layer. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down, hover over new item, click that, and I see adjustment layer. I'm gonna click adjustment layer. So I'm gonna say, okay, those are all the right settings. And I have an adjustment layer here. Now what I can do is drag that onto one of the other video clips, one of the other video tracks, and I'm gonna expand it all the way across. With the video tracks, if you add a second video track, whatever's on top, you can think of it like sheets of paper. Your first sheet of paper is the first video layer. If you take a little clip of a shorter piece of paper and put it on top of your long piece of paper, that shorter piece of paper, for however long it is, is covering the paper underneath. That's what's gonna happen with these adjustment layers. Or if you added a second video clip, say you were making an interview and then you added footage of some b-roll and you put it on top it'll cover the first layer of video you have in this case since the adjustment layer you can imagine is a clear piece of paper or not clear piece of paper but a piece of clear plastic you put on top you're not actually seeing anything because it's clear but if i were to take that piece of plastic and draw something on it and i put it on top of the piece of paper now there's an added layer on top just going to adjust the basic settings and try to make it look natural, but also good looking. So let's give that a shot. So I'm gonna click on the adjustment layer here and I'm gonna go up to color. Now you notice this panel on the side comes up and I'm gonna click basic correction. So all I'm doing, I have no rhyme or reason. I'm just playing with the knobs until I reach a, an image that looks good to me. What moving things to each extreme actually does in addition to me just figuring out what it, you know, where I want it is it gives me a sense of what the function of that thing is. Now, if I scroll through the video, that color is applied everywhere. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna make it look a little bit more cinematic. So I wanna add those bars, go back to effect controls, and I want to add a crop, type in crop, and there's crop. I'm gonna go with a top of 10% and a bottom of 10%. And there you go, bars are there. I basically took a clear sheet of plastic and on that sheet of plastic, I took a Sharpie, colored on the top, color on the bottom and added a film on top of it, put it on top of my sheet of paper that is my video. And now it looks different. If I wanna see how it looks with and without, I click that little effects button to turn it off, take the sheet off the top, click it back on, put the sheet back on top. So now that we've gotten through all of that, let's take a look one more time at the final product.
So what'd you think? So that concludes series one of the first 20. And I feel like there's a lot to unpack. The first thing is with regards to setting goals. Now, I always found it odd to try to set an attainable goal for things simply because I could never gauge what an attainable goal was. If I've never experienced it before, how do I know what a realistic goal actually is? And this applies to the first 20 hours because when I set 20 hours to something, I realized that it actually expanded my knowledge acquisition rather than restrict it. Because you would think adding a time frame to something would actually restrict that ability to learn. For example, when I want to try to achieve X, I would do what I need to do to learn how to do X. And once I achieved X, I would just move on. In this case, it was Adobe Premiere Pro. But what I ended up finding out is in reality, I achieved X with Premiere, being able to edit a video to upload it to YouTube at like hour three or four. And at that point, I actually started to think about potentially chronicling this, making it a series, doing it for other things. And then I realized that having a task oriented completion goal actually became secondary and filling the 20 hours became primary, which actually benefited me because of the fact that when I start to hit six hours or 12 hours in, what am I gonna do to fill those other hours? What I found out is those hours actually ended up being filled with deliberate practice, to sharpen your skills and or going to other tutorials to learn more tasks. And this has a profound effect on your creativity because what ends up happening, I feel like we've all experienced this countless times where we have ideas that we subconsciously suppress simply because we know that it would require certain tools as requisites to achieve those ideas. So when you start to gain tools, you start to unlock certain areas of your creativity because now you can achieve certain things now. The second thing that I thought about was that Premiere is a lot like a metaphor for life. Now, I know that sounds way hokey, but just hear me out for a sec. What I've heard from a lot of people who talk about success and talk about achieving your dreams, they all talk about having a long-term vision, but a significant number of them also talk about setting short-term milestones. You see, it's within our human nature to want to feel like we're making progress by having short-term milestones. And for some people, they lack so much grit that they would need daily milestones, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But everybody needs something to make themselves feel like they're moving that needle toward that long-term vision. Because if you just have a long-term vision, you simply cannot generate the momentum to keep going. When you have a vision of how you want something to look at the end, you start filming, you take those clips, import them into Premiere, put them on your timeline and start putting them into order you're already starting to see a manifestation of your final product. Then you start trimming it, shaving out the stuff you don't want, putting it together, adding audio, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see where I'm going with this. Each time you complete something, it gets you closer to that vision at the end. And you start to feel like the whole, as daunting as it is, you start to gain momentum towards it by the sum of its parts. The last thing that really hit home for me, particularly at the end of the editing process, was how unbelievably healthy it is to merely ship your product. And I felt this especially with episode three. You see, when I got to this point of editing episode three, I was so bored by how the footage came out that I couldn't even pay attention long enough to edit the video. And I'm not saying that to downplay the work that I've done. I'm actually kind of proud of it. And I say that with hesitation because I've heard so many times from the outside watching a creative and hear them talk about how proud they are of their work. And the first thing I think is, well, of course they're proud of their work. They live to be creative. But really, as somebody who is not naturally creative, as somebody who feels that this could have been executed so much better by somebody more entertaining and more charismatic, it actually made it feel that much better to be able to hit export at the end. It felt good that it didn't come out as good as I wanted it to be. It felt good that it didn't come out as good as I wanted it to be. I've gotten to a point where that alone makes me want to upload. I have now more than ever before pushed myself into a corner of discomfort and that is priceless. So anyway, thank you for making it to the end of this series. If you liked it, definitely hit that like button and share it, share it, share it with whoever you think might benefit from this. And if you didn't like it, go back to the beginning of the series and watch it through a couple more times. It'll grow on you. But until then, subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you in the next video.